Hello and welcome to the seventh installment of the COVID-19 webinar series hosted by the Joint Perfusion COVID-19 Task Force. Today's webinar will focus on the rationale and practical aspects of incorporating a cytokine absorption cartridge in a bypass circuit with ECMO as a strategy to treat cytokine storm and hyperinflammation in the critically ill COVID-19 patients with respiratory failure. Today's webinar consists of the following speakers. Dr. Philip Chan, CEO, Cytoabsorbance Corporation, and Mr. Stefan Zago, Ulm University, Ulm, Germany. Your moderators will be Linda Mangero and Luke Pui. I am Linda Mangero. I'm one of your moderators, and I am the Vice President of ECLS and ECMO at Specialty Care in Nashville, Tennessee. My co-moderator for today's broadcast is Luke Pui. Luke? Thank you, Linda. So today's broadcast will be recorded for future playback. We will have our two speakers, and afterwards we will have a 10 to 15 minutes Q&A. Uh, please submit your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom presentation window. And please address your question to a specific panelist so they know the answer to the question. If we do not get to your question, please consider submitting your question to the COVID-19 discussion forum linked on the Joint Perfusion COVID-19 Task Force website. And we are happy to announce that the ABCP has approved the Joint Perfusion COVID-19 Task Force to offer up to 1.8 category continuing education units for attendees of the live broadcast. After the conclusion of the broadcast, attendees will be provided with a link to a survey to claim your credits for the participation in the meeting and to provide the task force with information on the current operating status of your program. Even if you do not plan to claim credits, we would appreciate your responses to the survey. The survey, the survey link will also be sent off to all attendees one day after the live broadcast. And certificates to all registered attendees will be sent within four weeks of the broadcast. We would like to thank uh, the Sorbens Corporation for sponsoring today's webcast. So, Linda, it's up to you. Again. Thank you, Luke. We'll start today with Dr. Philip Chan from Sida Sorbens Corporation. Well, um, thank you very much, Linda. And uh, special thanks to AMSECT, uh, Jim Rieger, Tammy Rosenthal, uh, Linda Mangero, and Luke Pui for the kind invitation to be here today and to give you more information about Cytosorb and the use of cytokine adsorption in critically ill COVID-19 patients under FDA emergency authorization. Uh, I'm joined here today uh, by two of my additional colleagues from Cytosorbents, including uh, Mr. Vince Capone, uh, Chief Operating Officer and President, and Parker, Hu Parker Hutchinson, who uh, many of you may already know as being instrumental in the training uh, on Cytosorb uh, in ECMO and, and uh, on CRRT as well. And I uh, wanted to thank uh, Rona Kalinga for her technical help in getting this set up and uh, Dr. Stefan uh, Zygo for uh, joining us today also from Germany. So uh, just as a quick disclaimer, uh, Cytosorb was granted FDA emergency use authorization in April, 2020. The Cytosorb device has been authorized by FDA under an emergency use authorization to specifically treat patients 18 years of age or older with confirmed COVID-19 admitted to the ICU with confirmed or imminent respiratory failure. The Cytosorb device has neither been cleared nor approved for the indication to treat patients with COVID-19 infection. Uh, this is the case for all therapies being used to treat COVID-19 today, including remdesivir, which is also emergency use authorized. The Cytosorb device is authorized only for the duration of the dec declaration that circumstances exist, justifying the authorization of the emergency use of Cytosorb device under Section uh, 564B under the Act, unless the authorization is terminated or revoked sooner. Uh, so just a little bit of background on myself. Uh, I'm Dr. Philip Chan. I'm the CEO of Cytosorbents and have been leading the company for the past dozen years from a preclinical stage to EU approval of Cytosorb uh, and commercialization of this device in 65 countries around the world as a way to control deadly inflammation through blood purification. Uh, I 
I am an MD, PhD, internal medicine physician by background uh, with my MD, PhD from Yale School of Medicine and my internal medicine residency from the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center at Harvard uh, and uh, received board certification from the American Board of Internal Medicine in 2004. Uh, as a disclaimer, as I mentioned, I'm an executive board director and shareholder of Cytosorbin. Uh, so today we're talking about the application of Cytosorb under FDA emergencies authorization in critically ill adult COVID-19 patients with confirmed or imminent respiratory failure. And the FDA allows uh, actually quite broad range of use of Cytosorb in these patients uh, in three categories. One are patients with early or acute lung injury with early or acute respiratory distress syndrome. The second category actually provides for earlier usage. Uh, as defined as severe disease with people with dyspnea, respiratory frequency with a rate greater than 30 per minute, a blood oxygen saturation of less than 93% on room air, and either a PF ratio less than 300 or lung infiltrates greater than 50% within 24 to 48 hours by chest x-ray. And the third category would be classified as relatively late treatment in patients with uh, respiratory failure or septic shock or other multiple organ dysfunction and failure. Now, the EUA is fundamentally different from the FDA's expanded access uh, program for medical devices, which encompasses the uh, more traditional emergency and compassionate use. In this particular uh, program, uh, therapies that are still investigational in the United States uh, can be made available under emergency use for those patients who have exhausted all standard therapies. This typically requires ethics committee approval. It requires a third party uh, physician evaluation and, and and uh, that everything has been tried and, and has failed and the patient will likely die if nothing else is done. And under this program, it, it really represents more of a, uh, a therapy of last resort when they, when they bring other therapies on board. Fortunately, that is not what emergency use authorization is about. And in fact, as I mentioned before, the FDA will actually allow early use even on patients who are not yet mechanically ventilated, uh, but are, are pending imminent uh, mechanical ventilation. And, uh, and this can be, Cytosorb can actually be used off the shelf like any other ICU product that you have uh, and does not need ethics committee approval. Now, Cytosorb has been used in more than 2,300 COVID-19 patients in 30 countries around the world. And as an extracorporeal cytokine absorber approved in the European Union has been delivered to, it, uh, uh, to date with more than 100,000 uh, cartridges around the world. And in the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there's been actually a lot of activity around the world where blood purification to treat cytokine storm uh, for COVID-19 is in the Chinese guidelines for treatment. Uh, Cytosorb is specifically in the expert consensus in Colombia. Uh, we, Cytosorb is, a subject to, uh, is the subject of a med tech innovation briefing by NICE in Great Britain. Uh, it is the subject of multiple courses in COVID-19 in Germany. Uh, Cytosorb is specifically approved in India and in Israel for the treatment of COVID-19, and it is also recommended in the Italy and Panama guidelines as well. So when we talk about uh, the pathology of severe COVID-19 infection, uh, it's very clear that uh, SARS-CoV-2 is a very dangerous virus. It causes a very severe viral pneumonitis and viral pneumonia that creates a local uh, injury in the lungs, and triggers the production of local cytokines and chemokines that ultimately go systemic and result in the uh, ongoing production and stimulation of more cytokine production, leading to this upward spiral of cytokine storm, uh, ultimately leading to a hyperinflammatory state and a dysregulated immune response that can lead to multiple organ failure. And what Cytosorb is designed to do is to try to quell that cytokine storm by physically removing cytokines from the circulation. Now, for example, in, uh, in COVID-19, ARDS is a tale of two types of lung injury. On one hand, you get the very traditional exudative ARDS, and this is typically caused by hyperinflammation and cytokine storm that leads to endothelial tight junction disruption and leads to a hallmark of ARDS, which is capillary leak syndrome. This ultimately leads, leads to pulmonary edema, very heavy, wet lungs that are very difficult to ventilate, leading ultimately to hypoxia and often hypercarbia. Now, in COVID-19, we are seeing a second type of uh, ARDS, a more atypical ARDS, 
that is caused by thrombotic complications. Uh, and these thrombotic complications often are believed to have a root in direct endothelial injury caused by either viral infection, uh, cytokine storm, or activated complement. And uh, that often leads to a coagulopathy and a coagulation cascade leading to a depletion of anticoagulant factors uh, that then leads to a procoagulant state and a hypercoagulability that all of you on this call no doubt have seen firsthand. Uh, this often leads to macrovascular uh, clotting issues such as DVTs and pulmonary emboli, but it also leads to uh, microvascular uh, emboli, uh, thrombus, uh, often called thrombotic microangiopathy, where you get tiny blood clots in the capillary beds in vital organs like the lungs, the kidneys, and many other organs. And that ultimately leads to a ventilation perfusion or VQ mismatch, uh, where these patients are actually quite easy to ventilate, However, they are severely hypoxic and uh, often severely hypercarbic as well uh, with high levels of D-dimers that are byproducts of this clotting, this clot burden. And you can just see here in this uh, little picture here, this is an autopsy specimen of a lung taken from a, uh, a deceased COVID-19 patient uh, where you can see the macrovascular clot, these, these big clots here, but you can also see a lot of discoloration which represents the more microvascular clotting that is happening in these lungs. And what we find, however, is that it's not just one or the other, but it's typically both. And uh, in many patients, they exhibit both of these phenomena. And the, and the goal of cytokine adsorption in these patients is, is pretty simple. A reduction of cytokine storm through cytokine adsorption and blood purification may help to limit this uh, injury on both sides of this equation uh, to help the lungs recover and heal. Now to tell you a little bit more about what Cytosorb is and how it works, uh, uh, I present this slide. So Cytosorb is filled with hundreds of thousands of tiny porous polymer beads that are roughly the size of a grain of salt. Each of these beads has millions of pores and channels in them that allow them to act like sponges to be able to extract toxic materials from blood very efficiently uh, through really three mechanisms. One, it has to be, it, you have to be the right size to get into the pores, so pore capture. Two, the, uh, the, pore, the polymer is a hydrophobic polymer and can bind things through, can bind other hydrophobic substances. And proteins and peptides uh, turn out to be, often have a part hydrophilic and part hydrophobic nature to them because of the variety of different amino acid side chains that make up these proteins. And then the third way that removes things is based on concentration. It's just a simple law of physics. The higher the, the concentration of things pushing themselves into the pores of the bead, the more the beads remove. And you can see here just a schematic diagram of, the, of, a, of a, a cutaway of the beads where big things like cells and antibodies, they're too big. They can't get in these pores that uh, are typically have an upper cutoff of about 60 kilodaltons in, in, in size. Whereas uh, very small things like electrolytes and uh, go straight through the bead and are unaffected. But appropriately sized molecules, particularly cytokines and other inflammatory mediators, can go into this vast network of pores and channels ultimately never to come out. And you can see how effectively it can remove things in, in the lower diagram here, where uh, this is in, vit in, in vitro whole blood recirculation system that, is, uh, that has been scaled for human treatment. And with Cytosorb, you can see a rapid reduction in uh, IL-6, uh, MIP-1-alpha, and gamma interferon, for example, with Cytosorb. Uh, and without Cytosorb, uh, you can see that it's not removing much at all. And the important thing about this technology is that it does not require uh, any type of uh, affinity agent, no ligands, no antibodies, no biologics or cells. And the other thing about this technology is that it has massive surface area. So in a single one of these cartridges, you have seven football fields or more than 45,000 square meters of uh, surface area on which to bind cytokines. So just massive capacity. Uh, the good thing also about the technology is that it is plug and play compatible with the existing blood pumps that you have in the hospital today, whether or not it's a dialysis or CRRT machine uh, or, uh, or continuous renal replacement therapy machine or if it's an ECMO machine, uh, or if it's a hemoperfusion machine. Uh, in fact, in Europe, it is also compatible with heart-lung machines as well. And uh, one thing that, uh, you know, Stefan will actually talk a little bit more about the setup, 
but a couple things that I just wanted to point out. One is that in ECMO, which is really the, the focus of today's uh, discussion, you note that cytosorb is not in the mainline flow of, uh, of ECMO. It is actually in a side circuit where it is coming off high pressure after the pump, going through the device. The device is positioned vertically to where blood goes in through the bottom, percolates through the top, and comes out the, and comes out the top, uh, allowing uh, for the best use and best contact of the resin beads with inside the cartridge. And then it goes uh, back uh, pre-pump. Uh, and actually, Stefan will go over a number of different configurations that you can use and, and several that you cannot. Uh, but that being said, um, you know, the rationale of, of, of using cytosorb again in these patients, particularly as it relates to cytic capillary leak syndrome, can be illustrated by uh, this experiment that was done previously. Now, this was a 32-year-old female with very severe influenza pneumonia, severely hypoxic with ARDS on ECMO, septic shock, acute kidney injury, with a SOFA score of 18. Uh, they basically took a small amount of serum from her prior to cytosorb treatment and then overlaid it onto human umbilical venous endothelial cells. This is a cell culture model of capillary leak syndrome. And when they did that, what they saw through uh, immunohistochemistry and uh, electrical impedance measurements is that it caused massive disruption of tight junctions, which are the, the, you know, the spot welds, if you will, between endothelial cells that maintain the integrity of blood vessels. Uh, and then they treated the patient for 24 hours with cytosorb, and then they did the same ex exact experiment, taking a small amount of serum and overlaying it onto new human umbilical venous endothelial cells. And what they found was that it did not cause this massive tight junction disruption. So what this suggests is that cytosorb is removing actively things that are circulating uh, in your bloodstream. And again, your lungs see the entire cardiac output, uh, four to five liters of blood every single minute. Uh, and so it is removing something, whether or not it's hyperinflammatory cytokines or other factors, that may be contributing to this capillary leak syndrome, and that by in doing so, uh, cytosorb may help to promote healing by preventing ongoing injury of the lungs. So let's talk about the ideal situation to initiate cytosorb therapy. First of all, patients should meet the EUA criteria that we already discussed. Secondly, there should be no contraindications for use. Third, the patient should have evidence of hyperinflammation as judged by a high ferritin, often greater than 1,000, C-reactive protein that is also elevated, often greater than 100, and an IL-6, often greater than 500 picograms per mil. Now, uh, many centers don't have access to IL-6, so uh, uh, as a rapid turnaround, so they send it out, uh, but then they follow uh, acutely the ferritin and C-reactive protein, which are typically uh, very available to these uh, patients. Uh, in, in these patients and in these hospitals. Uh, fourth, that the patient uh, in, who is hyperinflamed should also demonstrate either a rapid decline in respiratory failure with respiratory failure imminent. And this is when uh, cytosorb is used, in fact, before mechanical ventilation. And in a couple centers in the United States and, and in several centers in Germany, uh, they have used cytosorb successfully to actually turn patients around and actually not need mechanical ventilation but that is uh, more anecdotal. But by far the uh, more common usage is when patients first go on mechanical ventilation and are, and are uh, uh, started on cytosorb in a CRRT circuit or when they start ECMO. And again, uh, what preliminary unpublished reports have uh, suggested is that early intervention achieves the, the greatest clinical benefit uh, compared to delayed intervention. Uh, Vasopressor-dependent shock is not required, but often is where cytosorb has helped, and I'll show you some data on that in a little bit. And again, uh, if you're starting cytosorb therapy, you would want to start it early, either concurrent with mechanical ventilation or concurrent with ECMO. Um, clearly, these are guidelines on the ideal situation and are not exclusive to other scenarios. Uh, however, we would not recommend you know, this to be used on patients, for example, who have been on mechanical ventilation for four weeks, on ECMO for two weeks, uh, who have no evidence of hyperinflammation, for example. That would not be a patient that you would want to try this on. Now, how to treat. 
uh, we recommend the use of four cartridges in 72 hours, where you change out the cartridge every 12 hours for the first 24 hours, and then uh, change it every 24 hours on day two and day three. In ECMO, we are recommending blood flow ranges of 300 to 600 mils per minute with a range of 100 to 700 mils per minute. This is a very high flow, low resistance technology uh, that, um, uh, that uh, does not cause hemolysis uh, up to uh, 700 mils a minute. Uh, and so uh, that's uh, one of the great things about the technology. In CRT, we are recommending two to 250 mils a minute of blood flow, again, a range of 100 to in, in most cases, uh, they never max out to more than 300 mils a minute. Uh, we we uh, uh, recommend that you try to avoid very low flow rates down in the 100, range, 100 mils per minute range because uh, then in hypercoagulable patients, this, uh, they have a ten, more of a tendency to have sludging of blood and their clotting uh, would be uh, more frequent. Now, signs of potential benefit. Uh, what we see routinely is a reduction in inflammatory markers like IL-6, PCT, CRP, and ferritin. Uh, what I would uh, also say uh, and is highlighted here on the right-hand side is we would not recommend using D-dimers as a marker of hyperinflammation. D-dimers are in fact a marker of extensive clot formation and no amount of cytokine reduction will dissolve a clot. And so if someone has very high levels of D-dimers, that may often be treating too late. What you're really looking for is someone with uh, you know, relatively low levels of D-dimers that are rising rapidly and then intervening with uh, extracorporeal blood purification with cytosorb and, and heparin anticoagulation is, um, uh, may help to uh, prevent that uh, ongoing uh, clot formation. Second thing that we often see is a rapid improvement in hemodynamic stabilization, a decreased need for vasopressors, with a rise in the mean arterial blood pressure, a stabilization of fluid balance, and a decrease or stabilization of lactate levels. Now, we also often see an improvement in lung function, but to be clear, this often is delayed. So while they're on therapy, you should see an improvement in PF ratio, a reduced FiO2 in patients on mechanical ventilation. Often they're seeing an improvement in lung compliance, an improvement in uh, parameters of mechanical ventilation and improved ABGs. And on ECMO, uh, you're seeing reduced need for oxygen, uh, reduced hypercarbia, reduced sweep gas flows, and improved ABGs. But recall that the, under, the underlying mechanism of cytosorb in ARDS patients is to remove the toxic insults to the lung that are causing ongoing damage. And then the lungs need a chance to heal, uh, ultimately then leading to decannulation from ECMO and then ultimately uh, extubation from uh, mechanical ventilation. Uh, and then also we've uh, also seen improved renal function as well. Uh, now considerations when using other COVID-19 uh, therapies. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Cytosorb removes things up to 60 kildons in molecular weight. And so Cytosorb is in fact compatible with convalescent plasma and antibody therapies, as well as immunomodulators like tocilizumab, also called Actemra, that are typically greater than 150 kildons in molecular weight. And these are far too large to be removed by Cytosorb, which has, again, an upper cutoff of about 60 kildons in size. Uh, special consideration when using remdesivir and dexamethasone. Uh, these are the two uh, drugs that probably all of your centers are using now. Uh, but Cytosorb has the potential to remove these drugs. And, uh, but uh, we have uh, recommendations on how to treat. So these are typically given as once a day dosing drugs. And uh, what we recommend is that, first of all, they're dosed before you start Cytosorb, and they're given one to two hours to uh, allow tissue and cellular distribution so that we are not removing it, because we only are removing things in the blood circulation compartment, not the tissue and cellular compartment. And then every time uh, on the 24-hour mark, when you're changing over Cytosorb therapy, uh, that you stop Cytosorb therapy, you administer remdesivir and dexamethasone, you wait one to two hours, and then you start cytosorb therapy again, a new cartridge again. Okay. Now, cytosorb can also remove some antibiotics. It removes some, and it does not remove others. Uh, however, we have recommendations on adjusting the dosages uh, of, of these antibiotics, often by either increasing the dose uh, or by using therapeutic drug monitoring for things like vancomycin and aminoglycosides. 
uh, or by giving an additional dose uh, one hour after you start a new uh, treatment. Uh, or, as we said with dexamethasone and remdesivir, dosing in between cartridges. And so uh, our support staff are available to make recommendations to your pharmacy to help manage these antibiotic uh, issues. And then the last thing is that Cytoserve is compatible with all catecholamine vasopressors, including norepinephrine, epinephrine, uh, phenylephrine, um, uh, dobutamine, dopamine, et cetera. However, vasopressin and angiotensin II are peptide analogs and may be removed. Uh, we don't have data that we can remove it, but theoretically we, uh, we can. So if a patient is, on vaso is in shock on vasopressin or angiotensin monotherapy, uh, they should be switched over to catecholamines uh, so that uh, to prevent sudden destabilization of the patient caused by inadvertent removal of vasopressin or angiotensin II by cytosorb. Uh, to date, we've not really seen this happen, but, uh, but in Europe where we have extensive experience, uh, they don't really use vasopressin as much as they do here in the United States. Okay, so turning to now cytosorb and ECMO to treat COVID-19 patients. The whole idea here is that Cytosorb, in combination with ECMO, represents a novel and potentially effective lung resting or lung preservation strategy to, to treat COVID-19 ARDS by providing gas exchange on one hand with ECMO and turning down the mechanical ventilator uh, so that you aren't causing ventilator-induced lung injury, while you're also removing inflammatory toxins like cytokines that are circulating, thereby allowing the lungs to heal. And uh, for many of you who don't know this, Dr. Robert Bartlett, the pioneer of ECMO and uh, was the former chief medical officer of cytosorbins for 10 years. And uh, I've had the good fortune to have been in good dialogue with Dr. Bartlett uh, throughout this COVID-19 pandemic and have exchanged a lot of ideas and concepts. And um, some of the advice that he has that may be helpful to uh, all of you for the management of COVID-19 patients on ECMO uh, include the following. If possible, let ECMO do the work of gas exchange. He's a firm believer that uh, you do not need to supplement with mechanical ventilation to manage these patients uh, and that you should allow true lung rest and avoid ventilator-induced lung injury. Uh, but he knows and we know that uh, many patients are often, uh, often have a uh, very severe hypoxia and hypercarbia where many centers are resorting to using mechanical ventilation and supplementing often with very high levels of oxygen. And that is kind of like filling a bathtub with a drain open, right? Um, on one hand, you're trying to help the lungs and rest the lungs with ECMO. But on the other hand, you're hurting the lungs by thrashing it, uh, the lungs with uh, high uh, toxic levels of oxygen and uh, barrow and volume trauma. So one of the things that, that he notes, and, um, and, uh, and we've seen as well, is that uh, over the past several years, many, uh, most hospitals have adopted blood preservation strategies where they've tolerated far lower hematocrits than and hemoglobin levels than they have in the past. Uh, you know, in the past, it typically was greater than 30. Now we're often with a hematocrit of uh, 20 to 25 uh, or, or a hemoglobin of seven uh, to nine, roughly. And uh, what he would point out is that uh, clearly blood is your gas exchange uh, carrier uh, in, your, in your body. And that uh, in COVID-19 patients, they've witnessed that many of these patients are severely anemic. And you may have also heard that for whatever reason, people with type A blood, for example, are much, have typically have much more severe COVID-19 infection than those with type O blood, for example. So there's something here and uh, what he recommends is that rather than resorting to mechanical ventilation, first try to transfuse them up to a hemoglobin of 11 and 12. And at Rush uh, Medical, for example, in Chicago, they've been doing this very successfully and, and having good uh, outcomes. So, um, you know, the goal, uh, you know, just to sum it up, the goal of cytokine adsorption with cytosorb and ECMO in COVID-19 patients is to try to improve clinical outcomes but it's not just to get patients off of ECMO and off of mechanical ventilation, right? But it's to get them off of these things faster, right? By promoting a healing environment for the lungs. Now to share with you just some data. Um, first, uh, we'll go to Germany and the University of Freiburg and Dr. Alexander Sipati, uh, who is running the Psykov uh, trial or the cytokine adsorption in patients with severe COVID-19 pneumonia uh, 
uh, trial uh, on ECMO. And uh, this is a 30 patient study and uh, they recently published uh, kind of an outline of the study and some initial data on cytokine reduction, particularly IL-6 reduction in these patients, which is the uh, primary endpoint of the study. And uh, uh, in this, in this uh, study, they're integrating Cytosorb with ECMO shortly after ECMO initiation. Cytosorb is changed every 24 hours for a total of 72 hours of treatment. And what they have shown is that, uh, you know, uh, in this randomized controlled trial in, in, in four treated, four controlled patients that there's a more dramatic reduction in cytokine in IL-6 in these patients with Cytosorb here in blue and uh, as compared to the control group. Uh, now, turning to uh, the Medical Center of Aurora and uh, Dr. Michael Furstenberg, uh, who is Chief of Cardiothoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery there, uh, he, uh, at a recent ELSO uh, webinar, actually presented data on one of his ECMO COVID-19 patients. Now, this is, was a very uh, sick patient, uh, uh, young, 44 years old male, but 172 kilos with uh, all the risk factors that uh, that predict bad outcome, including hypertension, prediabetes, asthma, and chronic kidney disease. He had a history of one week of weakness, malaise, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, with a temperature of 102, uh, and uh, satting 91% on two liters of nasal cannula. And this patient was admitted uh, very similar to patients you've seen in your hospitals. Uh, initial CRP 9.2, got convalescent plasma, got a five-day course of remdesivir, but continued to get progressively worse with a rising ferritin of 800, put on BiPAP and ultimately transferred to the ICU where he was ultimately intubated uh, with high uh, inspiratory pressures uh, and high need for oxygen. ABG uh, showed uh, acidosis with a high, you know, low PO2, high PCO2, uh, and uh, a high IL-6, not as high as we would typically see in true cytokine storm which is often greater than 1,000 picograms per mil, uh, but a high ferritin and, uh, and a moderately high CRP as well. This was his admission check chest, chest, chest x-ray when he uh, uh, came to the hospital, but this was his chest x-ray when they ultimately started him on uh, VV ECMO, uh, again, five days after uh, he was intubated and they began mechanical ventilation. Uh, and on that same day, they started Cytosorb. Um, uh, uh, I believe they, they did also, as we recommend, 72 hours of treatment with uh, uh, Q12 changes on the first day, followed by Q24 changes uh, on the next uh, two days. Uh, they supplemented with methylprednisolone, uh, and uh, that led to a, a significant reduction in inflammatory mediators and ultimately decannulation um, uh, nine days after the last cytosorb treatment. And on the day of decannulation, the chest x-ray uh, shows bilateral clearing. Uh, that patient ultimately self-extubated on, on June 22nd and was discharged to uh, acute rehab, uh, you know, on uh, uh, July 11th. And in fact, on follow-up was discharged home off oxygen, off dialysis, alive and well, um, and uh, 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 which was a, a, a great uh, case. And so um, turning now to uh, Froder and the Medical College of Wisconsin and Dr. Lucian Durham, who is the Director of Mechanical Circulatory Support and ECMO there, uh, he uh, uh, has summarized uh, some patients here for me and was kind enough to share a little bit of his data and some insight uh, into his patients. Uh, they've treated a total of 30 uh, COVID-19 patients with ECMO at their institution, including 10 of whom uh, they treated with ECMO and Cytosorb. And uh, in these patients, they integrated ECMO shortly, uh, they integrated Cytosorb into ECMO shortly after ECMO initiation. Uh, and they also used Cytosorb uh, Q12 for the first day, then every 24 hours for a total of 72 hours of treatment. In some cases, they treated longer. Uh, and uh, you can treat longer. In fact, if the patient has no contraindication and is doing uh, better, uh, there is the potential to treat an additional three days, changing the device out every 24 hours. And uh, uh, the most that we've heard for COVID-19 patients has been uh, eight days on uh, Cytosorb therapy. Uh, but one of the th interesting things that he points out is that Cytosorb seems to do better on those with very high ferritin levels 
Uh, and uh, he notes this is the trend in, in ferritin in those with lower levels of cytosorb, uh, ferritin with cytosorb, uh, but then in those with high levels of ferritin. So you're talking about greater than 1,000 up here, in this case, uh, a mean of, I think, 8,000, and uh, showing just a rapid reduction in ferritin with cytosorb treatment. Uh, and in, in this case, they predominantly use cytosorb alone as um, and then uh, he also noted a reduction in plasma-free hemoglobin and, and also a reduction in a rapid reduction in CRP as well. And uh, in summarizing his patients, he said that a, uh, roughly a third of the patients at his institution on ECMO received cytosorb therapy. They generally selected more severely ill patients who exhibited high inflammation as indicated by high levels of ferritin to get cytosorb. And that treatment resulted in a decrease in ferritin, CRP, and plasma-free hemoglobin noting that those with high ferritin levels uh, treated with cytosorb had a uh, more profound response. He did say that one patient saw a rebound in inflammatory markers, uh, but just underwent a second round of cytosorb treatment and responded uh, positively with a rapid reduction in inflammatory mediators uh, the second time around. Uh, that patient ultimately did well. Uh, and so uh, he reports 80% uh, survival uh, in those patients treated with ECMO and cytosorb. Uh, with one patient still on who recently started two weeks ago. Uh, this was an unusual patient who they didn't start early. That patient was, a, uh, I believe, a transfer who was actually on um, ECMO uh, for uh, three to four weeks, but was exhibiting hyperinflammation. Uh, that person is still on support, but doing well. Uh, and, uh, you know, this 80% survival uh, compares favorably to the ELSO data dashboard that you can see on the front page where uh, I think they're reporting uh, about 62% survival, uh, which has improved over time. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Durham would also note that in general, patients at their institution are, are doing uh, uh, pretty well on ECMO. Uh, and uh, again, Cytosorb is being reserved for for those um, who have really high levels of inflammation. And he would note that while results appear promising, this cohort was limited by small numbers. And uh, you know, so uh, we suggest to take those data uh, appropriately. Okay, so now turning to NYU um, and uh, Dr. Nader Moazami, who's chief of the Division of Heart and Lung Transplantation there. Uh, doc Dr. Moazami um, was actually one of the first uh, people to put patients on, on Cytosorb on ECMO in the United States. Um, and uh, he actually treated uh, five patients um, uh, pre-emergence use authorization. So this is, again, the old, under the expanded access for medical devices pathway, therapy of last resort, Hail Mary, if you will, um, kind of therapy treatment. But uh, has done a total of 10 patients. And uh, one of the things I wanted to, to to just show you uh, is the first four patients uh, that he treated here. Um, uh, again, using Cytosorb plus ECMO as a lung resting strategy to try to reverse ARDS. Uh, he used Cytosorb every 12 hours for the first 24 hours, then, then every 24 hours after that for a total of four cartridges in 72 hours. For the sake of homogeneity, uh, he did not treat uh, longer than 72 hours, uh, though has uh, mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, how he wonders how patients would have done with longer treatment. The blood flow rates at his institution were 400 to 500 mils a minute on ECMO with a range of 350 to 600 mils per minute. Uh, and uh, in these four, four, four patients, you can see a, a, a re nice reduction in ferritin, a nice reduction in CRP in three of the four patients. No real change in D-dimers. And again, you don't necessarily expect this to happen because first of all, D-dimers are very large typically. And uh, again, they are not hyperinflammatory markers. They are a measure of clot burden in those patients. And then um, uh, albumin is 67 kildons of molecular weight and Cytosorb was designed not to remove too much albumin, but we do remove some. Uh, and, uh, but what you can see here is that even after 72 hours of intensive treatment, uh, albumin really didn't change in these patients, which is a, a good thing. Uh, now, they also saw a uh, concentration-dependent reduction in IL-6, IL-2 receptor, and IL-10. In this case, IL-8 was normal in all patients. But this is really kind of a very interesting slide. 
This is the first four EU, pre-EUA patients, numbers one through four. Uh, the first one was uh, started on mechanical ventilation, started on VV ECMO on day four, started on Cytosorb on uh, day six. These triangles represent changes of the device, and then the stop sign is when Cytosorb was stopped. And at, at the time of this evaluation, which was actually several months ago, that patient was still on ECMO. However, the next patient, they started ECMO earlier. They started Cytosorb uh, kind of late on day eight, again, pre-EUA. And interestingly, five days later, that patient was decanylated off of ECMO. And the next patient, this patient rapidly spiraled uh, down, requiring VV ECMO on the first day. But then they started Cytosorb relatively late, but five days later, they were decanylated off of ECMO. And on the next patient, they started VV ECMO on the same day of mechanical ventilation, but they started Cytosorb earlier. And five days later, that patient was decanylated off of ECMO. And again, what you're not seeing is that they get decanylated off of ECMO while you're on Cytosorb treatment. But what is fascinating is, or what is what we're seeing here, the fact that we're promoting healing, and then it takes the lungs some time to heal, ultimately leading to improved uh, 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 oxygenation parameters and an ability to get them off of ECMO. Um, and so when, uh, 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 Dr. Mozami actually presented these data at the recent ELSO conference uh, last month. And uh, on all 10 patients, five pre-EUA, five treated post-EUA, uh, uh, the median age of, and, and then compared them a little bit to patients on ECMO alone. So like uh, Dr. Durham at uh, Froder, uh, at, at NYU, they also did 30 patients on ECMO, 10 of whom were on uh, Cytoserve as well. These patients were relatively young in age, uh, uh, mostly male, um, and uh, a BMI uh, on, uh, you know, on the, uh, on a little bit on the high side, uh, that uh, those treated with Cytosorb generally had uh, more comorbidities than those in the ECMO alone group, and that you can see here the parameters of pH, PCO2, PF ratio, and uh, uh, vasopressor uh, 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 score, and uh, and uh, he would note also that 70% of the patients in the ECMO group were on Cytosorb. 70% uh, had septic shock on vasopressors in those patients getting Cytosorb and ECMO versus uh, only 45% uh, out of the 20 patients on ECMO alone, uh, reflecting in his words a, a sicker cohort. Um, and so what he found was a uh, a statistically significant reduction uh, in, uh, in lactate and also in inflammatory mediators such as uh, lactate, LDH, ferritin, and procalcitonin, but also a, a, a significant reduction, a, a, uh, a marked reduction rather in uh, IL-2 receptor, IL-6, and IL-10, as well as uh, reductions in C-reactive protein. Uh, this uh, these patients were uh, pretty sick. The length of stay uh, was not statistically different, uh, but um, uh, uh, 53 days versus 38. Uh, but that 100% of the patients survived in the Cytosorb treatment group uh, compared to 90% in the control group. Now, these are not large groups of patients. So again, uh, we have uh, a limited ability to interpret these data. But what is interesting is that 80% you know, of these patients were discharged from the hospital in the Cytosorb group, 20% uh, uh, or two are still admitted to the hospital uh, on support. Uh, and, uh, and he would also note that the, uh, the overall experience at NYU has been pretty good. And again, they have been instituting ECMO on the earlier side in NYU. So his data uh, suggests that 80% uh, you know, are discharged from the hospital uh, that have gotten Cytosorb, including those where Cytosorb was used as a therapy of last resort. Uh, they had 100% survival with two patients still in the hospital, but again, due to small numbers, difficult to attribute to Cytosorb at this stage. However, they did see a significant decrease in inflammatory mediators like LDH, CRP, and ferritin, a significant decline in vasopressors, but not necessarily specific to Cytosorb, uh, but, but, um, but a common theme. Uh, and in patients treated after EUA, uh, where they did an extensive panel of 35 cytokines, they demonstrated a significant decline in a variety of cytokines and chemokines. And like all of the others uh, in, that have been reported uh, in, at other institutions, 
in this webinar, uh, they did not see any uh, device-related adverse events. The only thing uh, they saw at uh, in NYU was that one patient required substantial increase in sedation, and for this reason, uh, the device was discontinued. But otherwise, uh, no other major complications. Okay. And uh, now just turning to a, uh, a but, but this whole concept of early intervention with ECMO, early intervention of Cytosarb is uh, something that uh, uh, might be a strategy to help uh, uh, ARDS patients. And in a study in pneumogenic sepsis patients with, AR, uh, with ARDS on ECMO, who also are in vasopressors in shock, uh, uh, in a study that was published earlier this year, they reported on a prospective single center study in 13 patients with pneumogenic sepsis, three influenza, one fungal, nine bacterial, uh, ARDS on VV ECMO compared to a historical control population uh, of pneumogenic sepsis on ECMO. Uh, and what they did in these patients was that they actually got them on ECMO within 12, six hours of admission to the ICU or within 12 hours of sepsis diagnosis. But these patients had crashed meaning that they had full-blown respiratory failure on mechanical ventilation and needed ECMO right away. Uh, the SAPS-2 score, which is a, a measure of a level of acuity, uh, shows that the cytosorb group had a, a mean of 58, which predicts a mortality of greater than 60%. And those in the control had a, a SAPS-2 score of 50, which uh, predicts a mortality of greater than 50%. And all patients received at least two cytosorb cartridges and a maximum of three with ECMO that were changed every 24 hours. Blood flow rates were 200 to 400 mils a minute. They saw a very uh, dramatic reduction in CRP, PCT, as well as the need for norepinephrine compared to a much more variable course in the control. Uh, and importantly, uh, they saw a uh, rapid hemodynamic stabilization of these patients on norepinephrine. And they saw a mean duration on ECMO of eight days, a range of two to 23 days, versus 19 days, a range of 13 to 30 days, which is more typical of uh, patients uh, that we're seeing in uh, COVID-19 and, and patients that you've no doubt seen as well uh, with ARDS, often very sick. And uh, interestingly, um, none of the patients died. Again, this is a prospectively enrolled study uh, of rapid treatment with ECMO and Cytosorb, and none of those patients died. So this is not cherry-picked data of, of you know, patients who survived. This is the perspective data on, on survival, but not a very large population. But, but that being said, uh, uh, all 13 survived and were all alive and out of the hospital doing well at uh, 60 days versus 57% of patients uh, in dying in the control arm, which is more typical of what we would expect in this population. Um, and so, uh, so moving on, uh, uh, just some final words here on how to some things to look out for. Uh, yes. Sorry, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but we have uh, we were a little bit on a time uh, restraint, so we have another speaker. If you could uh, wrap up or go a little faster, thank you. Uh, uh, certainly. Um, yeah, I think that we should have plenty of time for questions and answers, but, um, uh, but I absolutely will uh, expedite this. Um, so just as a plug, we have a CTC registry that is filed with clinicaltrials.gov that is up and running. In fact, University of Chicago Pritzker has, was one of the first centers to put data into this uh, CTC registry that is collecting data from all over the United States in patients where Cytosorb is being used in hemoperfusion mode, CRT mode, or ECMO. And the primary endpoint here is mortality. The secondary endpoints is duration on ECMO and, and mechanical ventilation and other factors. And um, if you are interested in participating in this, uh, please reach out to Dr. Peter Nelson at Cytosorbents at pnelson at cytosorbents.com. Uh, we, our goal is to get to 50 to 75 patients and publish data on, uh, on what we have found. Uh, now, some practical guidance on anticoagulation. We know that these patients are hypercoagulable uh, and uh, Cytosorb is only compatible with heparin anticoagulation. Uh, we may remove, for example, bivalorudin and ergatroban, and, uh, and we definitely can remove uh, antithrombotics like PTY12 platelet inhibitors and uh, factor 10A inhibitors like Xarelto, for example. And so uh, you should only be using heparin on these patients uh, and making sure that they're fully anticoagulated uh, before you start cytosorb therapy. 
the good part is that you don't need to change your anticoagulation protocol. So whatever you're using on ECMO, whether you're using PTT, ACT, uh, or uh, anti-factor uh, 10A uh, assays, um, anti-10A assays, um, uh, you would anticoagulate them the same way. And the one thing I would say is that uh, what they've done in Italy and what many centers are using in the United States is that if you're ha still having problems with hypercoagulability, that the addition of aspirin as an antiplatelet, which is compatible with cytosorb, uh, has been used successfully to try to manage this hypercoagulability. Okay. Uh, and contraindications for cytosorb therapy, uh, patients with very low platelet counts, uh, as cytosorb can bind some activated, can bind activated platelets. Uh, any pre-existing contraindication to extracorporeal therapy, known allergies to the extracorporeal circuit, a history of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, which would then preclude the use of heparin. And so again, you can only use heparin in these patients. Uh, acute sickle cell crisis, morbid obesity uh, with a BMI greater than 40, any pre-existing advanced medical disease with life expectancy less than one month, this does not include COVID-19, but it includes things like cancer, for example. Uh, treatment deemed clinically futile pregnant or pregnancy. And then relative contraindications uh, are steroids in patients who are immune suppressed, but uh, you can use, as I mentioned before, this with dexamethasone, uh, uh, but dosed appropriately. And then the potential risks are very similar to what you see in most uh, extracorporeal therapies, uh, particularly uh, the risk of uh, blood loss, air embolism, infection and uh, thrombosis. Um, and so uh, finally, my last slide is um, the economics of cytosorb usage. So uh, under the CARES Act uh, and the medical severity DRG, uh, patients requiring ECMO uh, are being reimbursed at $142,000. Um, however, what we have found is that patients are in the hospital so long on ECMO or mechanical ventilation uh, that most hospitals are, are not uh, being able to capture any of this. They're actually losing money on many of these ECMO patients. And the, the, the cost economics uh, argument for Cytosorb is that um, uh, if Cytosorb can help decrease the time on mechanical ventilation and ECMO at a, at a full treatment cost of $6,000 for four cartridges and with the average cost of a day in the ICU of $5,000, if you can just shave off one day off the ICU, Cytosorb would actually pay for itself. Uh, so with that, um, uh, let me thank you very much uh, for your attention here today. And uh, uh, now I, uh, if we could save uh, questions to the end and uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Stefan uh, to talk about uh, how to set up the therapy uh, in ECMO. Uh, Stefan. Thank you very much. Um, can you see my slides or it's still not mm -hmm. Not yet. Yeah. There you go. Yes. Okay. So thank you very much for, for the introduction. Um, and um, Phil told already a lot of things um, I might repeat, but I just overflew. Uh, ah. The slides, um, they are repeating some things. So my name is Stefan Seigel, I'm 90, um, since 1996, um, the perfusionist um, and uh, European board certified perfusionist, 49 years old. And I am now a deputy senior perfusionist in our hospital. I live in Germany with my wife, two children, 14 and 10 years old, which are dreaming to become musicians, otherwise like me. Whatever, we enriched our therapy uh, spectrum with the cytosorb. Um, uh, since 2013, and we also made several studies and publications about it. Now, uh, I am very pleased and honored to have this opportunity to share with you um, our experiences in ECMO combined with Cytosorb. Um, I was asking if there is any change, any chance to provide a general but also reliable technical support for our 
an extreme illness situation and how does the body react to this combination. Um, it is widely known that extracorporeal membrane oxygenation is increasingly used um, uh, in different forms of shock, uh, lung failure, resuscitation, after heart surgery. Um, the two forms of ECMO application are well known, VV and um, VA approach with their different indications, applications and underlying pathophysiology. Um, that um, provides a cardiocirculatory assistance, um, blood decarboxylation and oxygenation in patients with cardiac or combined cardiorespiratory failure. Um, while the implementation of dedicated ECMO systems has brought huge uh, benefits to patients over the last years, a considerable number of patients develop a systemic hyperinflammatory response as a complication with various mechanisms appearing to be responsible for activation of the inflammatory system. This response is triggered um, by the underlying disease, which can be infectious or non-infectious in nature. Uh, ICMO uh, support itself, including shear forces, um, hypothermia and contact activation by the artificial surfaces. Clinically, that may result in vasoplegia, uh, acute kidney injury, intestinal ischemia, cognitive dysfunction, and multiple organ failure. Cytokines are regarded as important mediators in the systemic inflammatory response to extracorporeal circuits. The pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines, one of them, which is very uh, important, is IL-1, and there are the reference values, the tumor necrosis factor, IL-6, and IL-8 that could generate that so-called cytokine storm we have already heard about. A compensatory release of anti-inflammatory cytokines uh, may be observed at the same time, and the rebalancing the, this dysregulation of the inflammatory hom homeostasis um, with increased levels of pro uh, and anti-inflammatory mediators is discussed to be important to recover and maintain a functional immune system. The cytosorb uh, has received increasing attention in the recent years as uh, an additional treatment option for patients with um, elevated cytokine levels, which could lead to life-threatening complications. Its broad spectrum removal of inflammatory uh, mediators is a beneficial property to support the uh, re-establishing of a proper immune balance. I'm sure there will be many other added as uh, the time passes and the researchers progress. There are at the moment just a few case reports and small case series that um, talk about the beneficial use of the device in ECMO patients, but the evidence is certainly growing. Now to our VIP, um, the coronavirus. Um, what's happening actually in, uh, in the infection with uh, this virus? Do you recognize this pathway? Dr. Chan had uh, a very understandable presentation of this chain reaction. The pattern is quite the same. The virus can cause a respiratory disease, which can get worse, developing a pneumonia or an acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, if that is not possible to be uh, controlled, the landslide is on its way down with his uh, cytokine storm and the immune system response is dysregulated. Anyway, it is a challenge for all of us, but there might be a little bit of hope. Just a few words about the criteria for considering cytosorb in COVID-19 treatment. Besides the already known ECMO ECLS support indication and ARDS are the need of 
CRRT because of acute kidney, kidney injury, the refractory vasopelagic shock, and the typical age score, um, suggesting a secondary hemophagocytic lymphohistocytosis. A cytokine profile resembling secondary HLH is associated with COVID-19 disease severity characterized by increased levels of different inflammatory markers. Now a few words to the setup. The most recommended insertion uh, modality of an absorber into the ECMO circuit is the passive way um, without an extra pump needed. That happens when the cytosol is integrated on a shunt line on the main extracorporal circuit using the spontaneous blood flow from the high pressure port located after the pump to the low pressure port located before the pump. This setup is actually easy done. If the pump is separated from the oxygenator, it depends on what kind of system you have. But what if the pump is integrated into the oxygenator, like ours, the HLS system and cardio health? There's a possibility to combine ECMO with the CRRT, if that's indicated, that can be used independently from ECMO ACLS system. The adsorber can be installed pre-dialyzer, like we also mostly do, or post-dialyzer. There you can see another um, list of um, options to combine cytosol with an ECMO, such as passive um, solution, active solution, or independent solution. Um, but you see um, right uh, in the right corner a picture, uh, which is a very, very important issue, never bypass the oxygenator. I hope you can realize why. The safe uh, anticoagulation management is, as we have heard already, heparin. Other substances could be removed by the adsorber. The typical ECMO anticoagulation is sufficient to run the cytosol. Our tar um, ACT target is about 100, between 180 and 220 seconds. And because of hypercoagulability of in COVID-19, we keep it around 200 seconds. Uh, you can also consider the use of aspirin to improve and stabilize the anticoagulation. We have an easy manageable setup that you can see on a table, plus four clamps and two little um, saline solution to purge the cartridge. This is very much like the description in the picture. Um, there is mainly recommended procedure um, to integrate the adsorber into the ECMO circuit. So after setting up uh, and priming the ECMO according to the manufacturer's instructions, connect and deaerate the connectors or two-way uh, stopcocks or whatever is allowed and possible to our to your own setup. Connect the ECMO to the patient and run the therapy. Flush now the cartridge by slightly tapping it to completely deaerate it. The lines used for purging, that's very important, must be filled previously to not get air into the device. That prevents building of clots or and provide a proper function using the whole adsorption surface. Now connect the cytosorb post pump to the high pressure port. That's very important. You'll see why. And fill the cytosorb with blood, flushing the saline solution into the bag. Now you can connect bubble free to the pre pump port and think about clamping the lines before each connection. Now you can run the therapy with cytosol by opening all the clamps. 
Anticoagulation, as I said, is according to the standard ECMO protocol. There is an animation, you've seen it already for a better understanding. And you see the flow from the positive port after the pump to the cartridge in the right direction from bottom to top, as uh, Phil said already, back to the negative port pre-pump. If you follow accurately the steps and give attention to the whole system, understanding the flow direction, you will be in short time confident with the system. A few mention to it, uh, Cytosol is not in the main circuit, but in a bypass circuit. Um, the recommended flow uh, was already, already mentioned, um, 400 to 600 mils per minute. The pump flow might variate after opening the cytosol circuit. That's why you should adjust the flow and the direction of cytosol blood flow again is bottom to top. That's very important. You might need to change the cartridge. Then just think logically about each step that you have to do. Um, Clamp and disconnect post pump and flush the blood back to the, into the pump. But also a very important mention, uh, if there are any clots in the circuit, do not flush the blood back. Now you can prime the new cartridge starting with a step four Connect it again, as we have seen before, and you can run the um, flow again through the cartridge. Just reminding a few things. To avoid air embolism, cytosol should never be installed in the main ECMO flow. Never bypass the oxygenator. Otherwise, you will have a venous blood shunned through the cartridge towards the arterial line, impairing the oxygen supply for the patient. Um, always pay attention to the flow direction and always in vertical position, systemic heparin anticoagulation only, never get air into the device, recommended blood flow. And if you have a uh, ultrasound flow monitoring, you can use it in this circuit. There is also a flow chart. Um, you can use and have it um, uh, near to you um, to follow the steps for every sentence. Now, we have also a case report um, in our hospital. We had actually um, this year from April to June, four patients with COVID-19 on the ICU who needed a VV ECMO, but only one received a cytosorb. Um, that was a 64 years old woman, about 230 pounds. And she was admitted with a, a dry cough in a hospital, the symptoms were indicating um, COVID-19 infection, which um, was confirmed on day three. Her situation was unstable, unremitting fever, her CRP cont continued to rise, so she was transferred on the ICU. Due to vasoplegia, she got a compensatory tachycardia under oxygen therapy was um, slightly better, but not for long. And on the day eight, because of her low oxygen saturation, she needed to be intubated and mechanically ventilated. Even that was not enough. Her poor oxygenation, limited ventilation uh, um, possibility, vesoplagia, fever, that was difficult to manage and uh, the compensating trend uh, the decision has been taken to implant a VV ECMO. According to the team consent, we started the ECMO uh, cytosorb and CRRT um, at 16 uh, at 4 p.m., uh, almost 5 p.m. Um, on the day 10. 
The anticoagulation was kept with uh, heparin, ACT level about 200, 220 uh, seconds rather than 180. Um, after two hours already, we noticed a hemodynamic stabilization. Um, norepinephrine was reduced um, down to 100 microgram per hour. Um, an improvement in oxygenation and the possibility to slow down the aggressive mechanical ventilation after the first 12 hours of use, the first cytosubcatheter was changed, and the second one ran other 24 hours. And then was terminated, um, and she um, remained on cytos, uh, on um, continuous renal uh, replacement therapy another two days. The ECMO therapy was seized after seven uh, days due to the uh, regaining uh, of her pulmonary function. A day later, she was extubated after 10 days of mechanical ventilation. It followed three negative tests for COVID-19 and she was discharged after 23 days of hospitalization. Last week, she came well into the hospital just for a checkup. There you can see the inflammatory parameters from the day one when the ECMO started. As we uh, have heard uh, from Phil, um, in other um, studies, it's quite the same uh, pattern. At the end of the cytosol therapy, these markers were considerably reduced. And on the day she was weaned from the ECMO, it is a positive trend noticed towards her recovery. A few words to the conclusion. The cytosol therapy was associated in nearly all cases with hemodynamic stabilization, vasopressor reduction, improvement of oxygenation, and reduction of cytokine, uh, cytokine levels. Uh, comparison between earlier or later start of cytosorb in regard to onset of pneumonia points towards better outcome with earlier start of the treatment and also in the COVID-19 treatment where no device related adverse events reported. So thank you, thank you very much um, for um, listening and I am ready for your questions. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you both so much. We are now open for questions. Luke, do you want to choose one and, and begin? Oh, okay, that's fine. Uh, Thank you. Stefan, if you could uh, stop sharing your screen and then... Uh... Yeah, that's, that's what I, I am just... Uh... Now, so... Thank you. Uh, most questions were uh, around the use of heparin uh, on, on, uh, with the device uh, on ECMO, uh, but uh, as, as I saw, there is no uh, adaptation to the heparin uh, dosage, uh, maybe a little more, but are there any other substances or drugs that are removed uh, from the blood, like Maybe antithrombin uh, or other drugs uh, that we that we use in uh, in ex in ECMO. Uh, well, well, cytosorb has been used uh, quite extensively in cardiopulmonary bypass, and in fact, they've studied the removal of coagulation factors, and uh, it does not remove uh, coagulation factors to any significant degree. Um, now, in terms of drugs, because it's a hydrophobic polymer, it has the ability to remove other hydrophobic or lipophilic drugs. And so uh, the, the main classes of drugs we kind of talked about already, uh, the remdesivir and dexamethasone. And again, the way to treat that is to give the drugs between uh, changes of cytosorb. Uh, the other uh, class of drugs is, um, is antibiotics. And uh, we do remove some antibiotics, like vancomycin is a peptide antibiotic, which uh, we can remove very well, but can be monitored through therapeutic drug monitoring. Uh, but again, we would uh, just recommend that you, if you decide to use Cytosorb, uh, that just have your pharmacy contact us. And we actually have a very good uh, uh, pharmacokinetic data from uh, uh, extensive pig studies 
where we can uh, offer guidance on how to adjust the dosages of uh, these types of drugs. And then um, in terms of uh, vasopressors, again, compatible with the, uh, the catecholamines and just caution when using monotherapy for vasopressin and, uh, and uh, uh, angiotensin II, also called Giapreza, which many uh, centers may be using now. And uh, in those cases, just transfer them over to, to catecholamines and then uh, uh, to try to avoid this, this problem. In vasopressors, you know, the, the rapid stabilization of hemodynamics with cytosorb that we, you saw some data on today, for example, should hopefully help them get off all vasopressors at some point. Um, uh, but uh, at the initial start of therapy, uh, that's just something to be cautious of. Uh, Dr. Chan, something that you said I found very interesting regarding the use of the cytosorb uh, filter in improving renal function. Uh, that would suggest uh, inflammation uh, is causing acute kidney injury. So would you recommend the cytosorb filter for routine cardiopulmonary bypass across the board? Well, um, you know, cytosorb only is authorized under emergency authorization for COVID-19 patients who are critically ill. Uh, with imminent or confirmed respiratory failure. So we cannot make any recommendations on uh, other alternative, other applications as in the United States that would be considered off-label use. But the logic behind uh, the improvement in renal failure in COVID-19 patients, for example, is again, one, that the hypercoagulability often leads to clot formation, not just in the lungs, but in the kidneys as well. And uh, you know, even though acute kidney injury and renal failure often is multifactorial, there's a lot of factors that go to play in it, such as shock. You know, uh, a, a prolonged shock can lead to ischemic ischemia in the in the kidneys, uh, resulting in uh, tubular injury and then renal failure, for example. So if we can reverse shock, that may have benefit. But then another uh, uh, not well appreciated mechanism of renal failure is uh, capillary leak syndrome in the kidneys, uh, and uh, the kidneys are in a, a capsule that does not expand. And um, what what happens is that if you start having capillary leak in the kidneys, they will swell to a certain point, but then will not be able to swell any further. And then what happens is that intrarenal pressure rises and that decreases renal blood flow for one, but also shuts off urine output for another. And, uh, and the use of cytosaur by trying to control cytokine storm, reduce this capillary leak syndrome and help the kidneys try to heal is uh, one of the mechanisms of uh, potential mechanisms of benefit in these patients uh, to then, uh, and, and we've seen patients have a restart of, of urine output and kidney function in this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I have uh, some, some more practical questions. Maybe Stefan can, can answer these. Um, how do you measure the flow going over the, the device itself? Do you put in a, a flow measurement device or do you calculate it somehow? Uh, and is there any, uh, uh, in cardiac, in CS, I suppose it's cytosorp or cardiac surgery, I don't know. How much is the pressure drop uh, over the device? Can you give any comments on that? About the pressure drop, I, uh, I don't remember how much it was, uh, but um, depends on the, on the flow on the ECMO. Um, we had two uh, measurements uh, we made. Uh, one uh, was in vitro and one was at the patient. So you have al always a measurement of the blood flow to the patient. This is... Um, is clipped on the, on the blood line, on the tubing set. Uh, and when you're making the clips off, so you get uh, the flow to the filter, to the cartridge. We had a little bit of drop of uh, flow um, um, measured on the um, venous line. We, we just switched the, um, the clips and then you can uh, have a little bit of a uh, comparison between the blood, what you're uh, getting uh, into the patients with open, open circuit of um, cytosub circuit and with the closed circuit. And that's the different, uh, different uh, difference to, to make between the, the, the flows. And the other one, 
uh, it's uh, with an ultrasound measurement. That's what we uh, made in uh, in vitro. I can answer the under pressure drop roughly. If you're running at 700 mLs a minute, it's about 140 millimeters mercury pressure okay. drop. So it's really a, a low resistance, high flow device. Um, so at, at that kind of flow rate, that's a pretty good pressure drop. You know, uh, another comment is that we've actually modeled this. And uh, if you're using an ECMO uh, pump that is based on a centrifugal mechanism, not a peristaltic mechanism, but a centrifugal mechanism, uh, that because of the different gauge of the main line versus the, the side port that leads to the cytoserp cartridge, uh, there's a natural uh, resistance to that. And uh, what we've modeled is that it, it, it does not go over the maximum flow a rate of uh, the device of 700 mils a minute. So we recommend wherever possible uh, measuring the, the flow uh, in that circuit, but if you can't, uh, uh, we've modeled it that it does not exceed uh, the, the maximum rating of the device. Another question from the group is, is um, has, has a patient uh, that you know of or have any experience with that had been started on heparin already running, then, then ends up with a positive hit panel. Do you discontinue the cytosorb or has it been used in any hit patients to your knowledge? Uh, yeah, so uh, this has occurred and in that particular scenario, yes, uh, because the device is only compatible with heparin, if you need to stop heparin uh, and for example, change over to bivalirudin, uh, that is uh, not compatible with cytosorb, and we recommend, uh, and, and, and you need to stop the therapy uh, at that point. Uh, and so, yeah. Um, one, one comment I wanted to also mention is that, um, you know, I think in, in a prior uh, webinar on, at AMSEC that there was a question about clotting. Now, um, there's nothing particularly special about cytosorb that would make it clot uh, versus another component of the circuit like the oxygenator. Um, and so uh, the only times when we really see the device clot is typically in the first or second treatment at a hospital where they actually get air into the device. And that air acts as a blood air interface that is prone to clotting. And, uh, and by the way, when that air goes into the porous, porous uh, cartridge, it never comes out. And so uh, that's really the only time that we see that, uh, that clotting occur. And uh, typically at that point, it, it's because of uh, uh, that entry of air. If you can if prevent the air from going in, uh, we've rarely seen that, except for when there's an, an inadequate systemic anticoagulation, then the whole circuit clots off, not specifically our device. Okay. Uh, someone asks if, if it's available in Canada already? Uh, not yet, uh, but we are working to get it in Canada. Okay. I have uh, also a question. Uh, what is the rationale for having to change the device? Sometimes, so in the beginning, you have to change it out after 12 hours and then after every 24 hours, but you can keep it on for two days. Why do you actually need to change the device? Yeah, it, it has to do with the kinetics of, of things moving into the beads of the cartridge. And that what we see is that, you know, as you would imagine, uh, things are moving from the outside into the core of the bead and that takes time. And uh, what we've learned uh, in uh, non-COVID patients is that uh, the, the accumulation of things in the crust of the bead uh, represents a barrier to uh, additional removal because those things are making their way to the internal uh, uh, structure of the bead. So we can get rid of that entire uh, rate limiting factor by moving to a brand new cartridge that does not have this issue, if that makes sense. And so, uh, so particularly for patients who are very hemodynamically unstable and uh, patients uh, who are very sick, uh, that's one of the reasons why we recommend this change every 12 hours for the first day and then changing it out every 24 hours after that. Okay. Um, someone asks, um, if you can use it, well, it's nothing to do with COVID-19, but if you can use it for endocarditis and if there's a beneficial use in ECMO for ILI. Uh, 
Yeah, so uh, again, in the United States, uh, that is considered off-label and not allowed. Um, however, in uh, the European Union, uh, there is actually a randomized controlled trial that has been completed called the REMOVE trial happening at 15 centers in Germany that was funded by the German government in endocarditis patients undergoing valve replacement surgery. I think for the same reason, these patients are septic with high levels of inflammatory mediators and, um, and uh, 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 also a lot of instability during the surgery and after surgery, often requiring mechanical respiratory support. And so those results will hopefully be uh, announced. Uh, the top line results are expected uh, very soon. Uh, the trial completed in January. But again, in the United States, this is not an allowed application, uh, and we are only authorized for treatment of critically ill COVID-19 patients with respiratory failure. Has it been used in children? Yes, uh, but not uh, COVID-19 patients. In, in the United States, uh, COVID, again, we are limited to adult COVID-19 patients older than 18 years of age. But in non-COVID cases, it's actually been used uh, most recently in an emergency use case here in the United States on a patient down uh, as, as small as 2.5 kilos, so very small. And uh, there've been actually many cases published. Uh, and if you search uh, pediatric and cytosorb under PubMed, uh, you'll bring up uh, many of those cases, but uh, not something that we can really talk extensively about here because it is considered off-label and not allowed in the United States. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, do we still have time for questions? Yes, I think we have. We can do one more question. I, I think. Okay. Um, yeah, there's two more. <laughs> what, uh, someone asked why is cytosol contraindicated in patients with high BMI? I don't know if that is actually yeah. the case. Well, well, well. The the simple answer is that for those with a, a BMI greater than forty, it's almost like treating two patients with treatment meant for one. And uh, you know, obviously, uh, patients who are morbidly obese uh, also have uh, very bad uh, 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 lung dynamics. Some of the patients, in fact, that you saw uh, presented today were actually quite large with a very high BMI, uh, so it can be successful. But um, uh, generally speaking, um, uh, it's, it's really inadequate treatment for a person of that size. Even though the blood volume doesn't quite scale, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, that way, but but it is a lot of uh, inflammation to cover with a single cartridge, and and uh, that's one of the reasons why it's it's contraindicated. Would you would, sorry? Would you advise putting in two cartridges? So we we have tried that strategy. Um, uh, we've never done it early in uh, in these patients, um, but what they do is that they've uh, treated more frequently. So as we're recommending every twelve hours treatment, it's actually been used every eight hours of treatment, for example, uh, uh, so to get a higher dose, as we were talking about. But um, uh, it's not something that uh, we have a lot of experience with. Okay, thank you. Sure. Stefan, one last question. Um, it, it was, uh, you mentioned the increase uh, in blood and air interface, and one of the participants said they'd heard that there was difficulties in de-airing the cartridge while in the priming sequence. Are there any tricks that you can share to prevent this? Um, first of all, you um, get a filled cartridge already. And it's very important that the priming line, the purge line, to be filled previously. Because if it's full of air and this air is getting into the cartridge, that's very difficult to get it out of it. And if you really follow um, the steps and really avo avoid getting air into the system, this is very, very important. Um, it's, it's not going, I, I've never seen a cartridge after it be, being deaerated properly that it's Caming uh, another other bubbles uh, up uh, to the top of it. So if you if you flush it properly, and uh, get all the lines filled and connected bubble free. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, uh, Stefan, as you correctly point out, it's shipped in saline, deaerated to begin with. Uh, sometimes you may see a small bubble at the top, 
uh, but that in, during the flushing procedure, uh, that comes out. And so uh, any, any comments on that, Parker or Vince? Do you, do you have a formal protocol for use of the cytosorb filter? Yes, for COVID-19 patients. Uh, we have an IFU. Yeah, we have an IFU that's available. If you go to www.cytosorb.com, and we actually have a, a whole section on COVID-19, and under there are actually all the documentations needed, uh, is the documentation needed, including the IFU on how to set this up. There's a lot of other helpful information there as well. So, so Linda, it's actually shipped with the IFU that's approved by the FDA. Okay. You can actually find it on the FDA website as well, all the documentation associated uh, Perfect. Uh, with this. Perfect. So with that, I, I want to thank you again for joining us today uh, for this webinar, and thank you so much to our speakers. Uh, the recording of this webinar will be posted on the Joint Perfusion Task Force website within two days. Uh, at the conclusion of this call, all attendees that have joined us on their devices will be provided with a link to complete a survey to claim credits and provide us with feedback on the status of your program's operations. The link to the survey will also be automatically emailed to all participants one day after the conclusion of this webinar. And we would greatly appreciate your participation in the survey to help us guide our future work. Thank you again to Side Absorbance Corporation for their sponsorship of today's webinar. And if your question was not answered, please join the discussion on the Joint Perfusion Task Force website and post your question to this discussion forum. Again, thank you all and take care. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you.